appreciate everybody coming. Uh, again, Paul Ralston. I uh, live just five miles from here, so uh, not too far away from home. I am by far no means an expert in any of this. There are several around this room that can answer way more questions than I can. I think there's a rule. You've got to be so far away from home to be considered an expert, so I am entirely too close, even if I was 500 miles away. Just a humble farmer from right here in Hardin County. Um, I'm going to talk some about how, uh, how the, I value what we uh, have in E-Fields, but to get there, I thought uh, I'd talk about what we've been doing as far as our trials are in E-Fields. Uh, again, Ralston Farms, uh, we cover about 1,300 acres of corn and soybeans. Uh, traditionally, it's about a 60-40 rotation, a little heavy on corn. Uh, we're primarily uh, vertical tillage and no-till. Uh, we do utilize uh, cereal rye as a cover crop between corn and soybeans. Uh, typically, we're trying to fly that on in August and uh, get it up and growing. Uh, we farm uh, to the south or the eastern edge of the Scioto Marsh uh, till clear till uh, just west of Kenton. I farm with my mother. Um, my dad passed away when I was uh, 21. And uh, I come home from college and took over the farm, and mom is my uh, full partner. And uh, she likes to think she keeps me in line. So uh, there's several friends and neighbors in the room, so uh, they can tell you on uh, how well she keeps me in line. One of my big mottos is if uh, you do what you've always done, you always get what you've always gotten. I've heard I don't know how many people, and most of them, well, I never see any of them in this room or any of the rooms here. They always say, oh, you know, I've always done it that way. I don't need to change my practices. We've uh, always gotten along really well doing what we've done. We're just going to keep doing it. Uh, that is not me. So uh, studies that uh, we've done that's in E-Fields uh, is the late season nitrogen timing study and uh, soybean seeding rate trial. The um, reason I started the, uh, the late season nitrogen, we was uh, interested in Y-drops. I uh, actually purchased the system in uh, 2015, started Y-dropping, and uh, I wanted to verify Greg Sauter's re results that he publishes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. There is uh, several speakers coming up that is going to talk about late season nitrogen. I will tell you, uh, Mother Nature has a hand in everything that we do. Um, no matter how you're applying your nitrogen, make sure it gets in your corn crop. And when you get rained out because you can't side dress, give me a call because I do do some custom. Uh, but, uh, you know, getting your nitrogen there is the most important thing. Um, and then on the uh, soybean seeding rate, uh, I'll touch some more on that. I got, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the late season, but uh, I'll spend more time on the seeding rate because that's one of my true passions, I guess, as far as my uh, studies that we've been doing. So this is our uh, late season nitrogen rig. It's a uh, 2200 Miller Nitro with uh, 23 Y-drops. Um, we uh, purchased it, and uh, we've done all kinds of studies with it, uh, not with E-Fields, but uh, we've tried doing some variable rating things. Uh, we've done strip trials with it, and I have all kinds of data with uh, my crop consultants that we, I use. But uh, it's an interesting machine. Uh, it's an interesting time to be covering cornfields. Um, you can actually see what's going on where we've done some fungicide spraying too, and you don't really get to see as much besides just the top parts of the corn plant. Uh, when I'm covering it with uh, the Y-drops, you really get a good view of what's going on there in the field. So uh, this is this year's data. Um, as I said in the, one of the bullet points, Mother Nature has a hand in everything we do. Uh, this year threw me another curveball. Uh, and we uh, missed our V8 time frame. And uh, rather than just throwing out the whole thing, I said, well, let's put a three-quarter rate in there. 
Um, they wanted me to do a zero rate, and uh, after the spring we had, I said, there ain't no way I'm not, not putting any nitrogen on that corn. I said, I'll do a half rate. So we did do a half rate, and then we missed out our V8. Uh, we done a three-quarter rate. So that's uh, shown there, the 21 and 23. The rest of them were all put, I put 42 gallon on. Um, we've done our first uh, study with Mark Botcher is my extension agent here in Hardin County. Uh, I'd done my first study with him in 2016 and intended to repeat that in 17. And uh, for those of us around, 17 was a terrible year. Uh, we had very limited time to side dress and even late season side dress. And uh, it got so late. In fact, I didn't side dress some of my fields because they looked so bad. So we didn't... Uh, we didn't do the study in 17 like we wanted, but we did this past year, and uh, I think I had some pretty good results with it. So uh, it doesn't show a lot of differentiation between the, and I think that's where I'm saying that no matter how you apply your nitrogen, just make sure you get it on. I like my method because my window's a little wider. So, uh, yeah. One. So I put on 15 gallon of 28 with the corn planter, and uh, we'll spray it. Spread some uh, AMS usually with our phosphate that we spread before we plant, and then uh, the rest of it is all side dressed. Um, we're intending to do some changing with our the way we do our nitrogen program, but that out, requires an outfit of my planter, and I'm not ready to spend the several thousands of dollars to do that yet. So. Uh, but this is this is just nitrogen. This is just side dress rate here. So moving on, uh, I said well, I'm going to talk much about the side dress or the late season side dressing soybean population. This was my goal. Um, we farmed some uh, pretty good dirt here, uh, just south here on the edge of the side of the marsh. Uh, I know there's some guys in here that have some. There are neighbors of mine that have some dirt that's probably even got more and higher organic matter than this. But um, it was a real challenge. We can grow great corn year after year, but soybeans have been a real tough thing to do. Um, I can remember about 10 years ago we went out to start uh, scouting aphids, and I could walk into soybean plants that would be up to my shoulder. And they was in seven and a half inch rows. So if you can imagine... Uh, trying to harvest them because they lodge, they'll lay over. One of the problems we had, uh, there's a handful that I, I had this fall. So uh, it's great ground, but it's a challenge just as anybody else's clay knobs a challenge. And I farm those clay knobs too. So in 2016, uh, it kind of started in 2015. Uh, I'm a Bex guy. Make all the fun you want about me drinking the Sunny and Scott Kool-Aid. I don't care. I like Bex. Everybody has their own opinions on their seed company. Everybody produces good seed. Use what you like. I, I grow Bex. Um, in 2015, we was at the London PFR site, and uh, they made a mistake. They went from uh, planting a, a, uh, a soybean plot in 15-inch rows and went to plant their population plot or went to plant another plot, and they went to 30-inch rows and didn't reset their transmission and planted 30-inch rows at 75,000. And it was touting, you know, the differences in what the plant looked like and this and that. And that really got my interest sparked. I said, if they can grow beans like that at 75,000, there's no reason I can't do that in the muck. So that's kind of what sparked my interest. Uh, went home and started talking about my plan. And then uh, called Mark Botcher when he said, hey, I wanted to do these studies. I said, hey, bud, you can help me. We're going to do this. So uh, 2016, I, uh, we, we have a 1790 24-row planter that I plant beans with in 15-inch rows. I got to looking in my book, and I said, I want to plant 75,000 like they did. The lowest my bean planter would plant is 101,000. <coughs> with the 108 cell soybean disks that we typically use. I wasn't happy with that. We, we run a mechanical transmission 
uh, at, when I bought the planter, I had limited hydraulic power on the tractor, so we didn't do uh, hydraulic drives. So I thought, well, I won't really want to try this. I'm going to put bean plates in the corn planter, and I'm going to plant some 30-inch rows. And the mock, they'll grow tall enough. They'll shade the rows, and I'll be fine. So we kind of laid it out in some 30s and some 15s. Uh, I wanted to try some ultra-low populations, so we went... Uh, to 60 and 85,000 in 30s uh, that we couldn't do in 15s, and then we added a, uh, a high population in the 15s. So there's my population. 16 wasn't a great year to do research either. Um, we uh, come up with some collusions that I'm never playing 30 inch rows again. Uh, I can remember as a kid, Dad cultivating all the time, and yep, pretty sure that's what we'd have to go back to doing. And yeah, I like to go fishing every now and then, so we're not going to do that. Uh, that year, I I solely focus on the economics of it as much. I mean, you want to see the yield, but at the end of the day, it has to pay for itself. So in my evaluations of all my plots, I put it down to economics. So. Uh, in 16, the most economical was 135,000. Uh, 112 was the closest, and that was in 15-inch rows. I think the first place 30-inch row was like 112, but it was like fifth or sixth in the plot. Uh, it was that far down. So, of course, there's Mama Doris telling me, I told you 60,000 was crazy. Um, and she constantly criticized me on my 60,000s, but was always surprised how well they would fill out rows, but um, she would still criticize me. So, 2017, uh, I abandoned the idea of doing 30-inch rows. Um, we didn't have a great year in 16, so budget-wise, I didn't really feel as though I wanted to put a hydraulic drive on the uh, bean planter. Uh, decided that uh, we needed to find an alternative. I looked at re-gearing my bean planter to try to get lower populations and decided that was going to be way too complicated and got to reading a blog on uh, the internet that said, hey, we plant beans with a cotton disc. Well, I don't know how many of you around here have ever seen a cotton disc at your local John Deere store, but you don't find them around here. And uh, with a good, quick Google search, there was a good old, good old guy in uh, Iowa that bought a planter out of the south that so happened to get 24 uh, cotton discs with it, and he wanted rid of them. So I gave him 200 bucks, and I got 24 cotton discs, which if you went to John Deere, these are about 20 bucks a piece. So we went ahead and done it. Um, the thing about a cotton disc, this is a 64-cell cotton disc rather than a 108-cell. Uh, the hole's a little smaller, and they have these notches on them. Um, we've had to run... Make sure we have our talc and graphite up to par. I use talc and graphite on all my seed. Uh, technically, you don't have to use talc with soybeans, but I use the talc graphite and all of everything. So you have to make sure that's on there, and then I'm constantly adjusting my vacuum pressures uh, and watching my seed drop and stuff. So uh, somebody asked me the other day how much more vacuum you got to run to make sure you're sucking seeds to that plate. I couldn't tell you, I guess. We, we're always playing with that because... Um, you can, if you change soybean sizes or anything like that, you can look right on your population monitor and see how much, if you need more, if you need less. So, uh, we had one instance where uh, I wasn't loading the planter and they ran out of talc and they went ahead and loaded it and called me about an hour later and said, Hey, Paul, we've, uh, we keep increasing the vacuum pressure, but uh, it's only dropping like 100,000. And I said, Well, have you checked the seed disc? And they said, yeah, about 50% of the holes got beans stuck in them. So we've ta I've talked about drilling the holes out a little bigger and trying to sand down these since I don't have a lot of money in them. But uh, ultimately, we'd like to go to a, a uh, hydraulic drive. I still like the idea of these plates rather than these because I get a little better singulation with these. If you look at them, you know when these are going around, they're dropping about three seeds at a time, where this one spaces them out a little better. And I truly do believe that's a big benefit with uh, trying to lower your populations while maintaining yield is singulation and getting those plants at a steady 
uh, uh, spaced accurately and placed accurately. Um, so 17 was not a good year at all. Um, we planted the plot, I think it was the last week of April. In the first week of May, we got about six inches of rain. Uh, this, I, I almost scrapped the plot. I wanted to just go in and plan through it and say the heck with it. The, when we done popu- I, I didn't. When we done population counts in the spring, the 60,000s were about 35,000. Uh, it thinned the plot a bunch. And then I think the two tens even in the plot were down to like 150, 140. Um, I have all that data, and it's, it's not in last year's e-fields, but uh, we have that data, and, and Mark Botcher has that data. So end of the day, the 120 actually shined. Uh, it was the most economical as far as yield and uh, seed cost. So uh, I was kind of intrigued by that, even though, it thinned so much. I think the final stand on 120 was right around 80,000. So that really made me believe, you know, there is something to this lower population stuff. Mom still tells me I'm crazy. Uh, she almost won out this year on the 60,000. Almost. She really didn't want me planting 60,000 again. She said 90 is low enough. Start at 90 and go from there. And I said, now nah, let's try one more year. So... <clears throat> 2018, we've done the same thing as far as our, our populations. Uh, we added some starter fertilize. Uh, when I bought the planter, uh, we outfitted it with on-seed starter uh, because in the marsh we have such a manganese deficiency. I can spray manganese on beans that are only got two leaves because they got yellow flash in them. So we was trying to eliminate that first manganese pass that we'd been applying, so we actually outfitted it with liquid fertilizer and was putting, I was blending manganese and water and trying to eliminate that first pass. It never worked, by the way, but <laughs> I had that system on the planter, so we decided we'd go ahead and uh, add a little starter fertilizer. We had an awesome growing season this year. Uh, we bested our overall farm average by 10 bushels the acre on soybeans and corn. It was almost 50 bushels the acre over our overall average. So we had an awesome growing season this year. Uh, conclusion, and this is in the eFields book, um, really no major statistical difference, uh, but the 120,000 still uh, held up pretty good there. Um, so I was good to see two years back to back that 120,000 would, uh, would hold up. Mom said that's still the lowest yield that we've, we've in the plot. But she was really happy with 67 bushels of acre. In the marsh, typically, I would tell you, we'd raise 200 bushels of acre corn, no problem. But to get 50 bushels of acre soybeans, I'd be thrilled to death. Um, so, and, I, and everybody would say, well, why don't you just do corn on corn? Well, I cash rent some of this ground, and the landlord says, nope. You ain't doing corn on corn. He'll let me do two years, but he won't let me do continuous corn. So we have to grow soybeans every so every now and then. And wheat is absolutely not an option uh, on this black ground. So um, something I found interesting was the uh, the differences, which Elizabeth alluded to that in the previous con in the previous one. The the average um, I done these numbers last night because I had a they had an e-fields meeting down in Piqua, and uh, we talked about this. And I guess it wasn't quite as bad a population drop as what I had considered. Uh, Mark and I still aren't quite sure what that uh, happened to that 180,000, but uh, I don't know. We think really that uh, soybeans will naturally find their own population that they like. Um, even at that 210 and you're losing that many, that's... Seed, I still think you're wasting. So, uh, here's what it is there, I guess. I show uh, these pictures. Uh, these are harvest pictures from this year. Um, I'm going to correct myself. At the Pickle E Fields meeting, I said uh, I gave the wrong population, but uh, this is actually 60,000. And this was another field that's 145,000. And there's the two fields side by side. So if you really look, 
that soybean plant has really made up for itself with that low population. Now, them plant stems are about the size of my thumb. So it'll make a cutter bar really shine if you uh, don't have it well tuned, I will tell you that. Uh, we've had some issues with knives, I will tell you. Uh, especially when I'd done them ultra low in the 30s, those were a bear to cut. Uh, you slowed down about a mile and a half slower than what you normally run, and they were not fun to cut. But in the 15s, I really don't have near the problem that I find. So um, These are my numbers as far as, uh, as the return and everything. I know OSU uses the OSU budgets. These are my actual numbers. I use... Uh, Oh, I think I used 850 a bushel, uh, 850 a bushel soybean price, and then list price for uh, 296 uh, L4 soybeans from Bex. So uh, again, that 120,000 I think really shines. Um, the 210 and the marsh is just way unfeasible. You'll never see a return. They're so thick that they lay over. Um, I had a picture that I was thinking about this morning that I didn't have time to put in the in this. Uh, we had two plants that were we had and this year's plot. We had two rep, uh, replications, um, but I had a 210 and a a 60,000 plot that was side by side. And I walked down the road. Mom was with me at the time, and I said, uh, and I pulled both plants and they were side by side. And the uh, 60,000 had 125 pods on it. And the 210 had 43. And uh, that kind of made mom a believer. So Elizabeth showed this. I, I drew a line on uh, my plot, I guess, the Hardin County line. There is a correlation there as far as yield. But the economics aren't there. So um, end of the day, I'm going after economics. I want my most return on acre, not highest yield. Uh, I've yet to see any of the high yield guys say that they don't really doctor something and, and make it uneconomical. So I'll talk some more about the uh, now about some values. Uh, I really believe we need to be willing to try new ideas uh, and work with each other to uh, validate some of these ideas, I guess I'll say. Uh, that's where I think the e fields is really nice. Um, you can use re the research that we that is in e-fields to kind of give you a beginning idea on where you'd want to start. But everybody needs to validate their their own on their own acres. Um, just because what I have 120,000 probably isn't going to work on the clay knobs. I truly believe that. Um, we don't plant 120,000 or 60,000 on top of the clay knobs. I don't do it. I have reduced my population because of what we've been finding, but I understand. The calendar also has something to do with a lot of, of my decisions on the population. Um, I wouldn't expect guys going out there and planting uh, double crop beans to only drop 150,000 and expect to get a, a good return off that. Uh, you need the population there to get that. So. Uh, need to be willing to try some new ideas. Uh, use the the data that everybody that is being provided from through eFields as a good starting point. Uh, don't be afraid to ask others for help. Um, I tell everybody uh, we're all friends and neighbors, and uh, we need to be able to use each other and bounce ideas off each other. And uh, if I have a piece of equipment that you want to try. Um, I'm sure I may grumble about it at times, but uh, I'm, I'm more than willing to help people out. So, And, you know, with the extension folks and, and uh, folks at OSU, they're always willing to get some data, and they're always willing to help out. Even though Elizabeth has told me several times that she's more than happy to come change transmission, she's yet to show up. But she does help. She does help. I, will, I do say. <laughs> we lay it out pretty well. So... Uh, I've got it down to where rather than changing the transmission at each plot, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start a population and I'll do the strips using my guidance and 
So you really you're only changing the planner about five times or six times rather than yeah a bunch. So um, if you have something you want to try and they require special equipment, I got a, I know I have a friend that has a, a totally outfitted planner with hydraulic downforce and V set and V drive and all that, and he would love to come do that. Uh, and if you don't know them kind of people, there's uh, people around that uh, will guide you that way. So.